Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'll give folks a couple of seconds to join in here uh, as we get started with today's program. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the tremendous pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. And we're so grateful that so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to join us for this fascinating discussion near and dear to our hearts about George Washington's final battle, the effort to create a capital city, a federal district along the banks of the Potomac. Before we get to today's engaging discussion with a wonderful scholar, I'd like to go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters. Uh, while we're still limited in how we can engage with you, our audience, directly, uh, we love using the Zoom webinar platform to bring this sort of scholarship and programming to you, and there are ways we can engage while we do so. If you have Tech, if you have content-based questions for Dr. Watson over the course of today's program, you can put those questions into the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using to join us today. Now, if you have any technical troubleshooting matters, if you think you're having uh, difficulty hearing or seeing the webinar, uh, you can put technical matters into the chat section. I'll be keeping an eye on that and troubleshooting in real time. But once again, any content-based questions for Dr. Watson should go into the Q&A section of the webinar platform. It's now also my great, great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to start today's program. Jane? Thank you, Sam. Uh, and thank you so much for all the work that you do uh, day in and day out for the Society uh, to bring these programs to our supporters and our viewers. We're honored to have you with part of our team. Today, my friends, we have a really fun story. Uh, Robert Watson, Dr. Watson as we call him, um, is a professor, an author, a historian, a media commentator, and a community activist. He's the author of over 40 books and 200 scholarly ar articles. And he has uh, convened or co-convened over half a dozen national conferences on the American presidency, regularly lectures at universities, museums, and historic sites around the country, um, and is a frequent visitor to Washington and reports to us that each time he comes to Washington, he tries to find a reason to go into the Capitol, um, to go to the Washington Monument and to stand at the Grant uh, Memorial and just think about the complexity of our government, the majesty of our democracy and the determination that it took for George Washington to create Washington DC as a capital city. And so today he's here to talk about his latest book or one of his recent books, I'm not sure it's his latest one, um, George Washington's Final Battle, which was not a battle on a military field, but the battle to create Washington, D.C. as our capital city. Some of us have learned the story from Hamilton about the room where it happened, uh, but this is a little bit more complex uh, evaluation of what it took to really imagine a capital city that was worthy of the aspirations of this country. And so that being said, I will present to you Professor Watson. As always, put your questions in the Q&A. I will monitor those and when he finishes his presentation, we'll work through the questions. Dr. Watson, we have an amazing audience and they are always full of interesting questions. So we look forward to your conversation and we look forward to the talk back as we move forward. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Samuel, and to your entire team there at the Society, Yanni and, and all the staff. Uh, I wanna thank you for what you do. Uh, I love my Capitol building and I visit it every single time I go to the city. And as an historian, uh, I just uh, really, really take my hat off to the work that you do to keep this building's uh, uh, memory and story alive and upfront uh, with the American public. So thank you for that. To the audience, thank you for uh, 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 joining us and thank you for your support of the society. Uh, they do uh, very important work and, and these days it's more important than ever. So uh, I'm delighted to be here 
Um, I'm an historian, so there's nothing better than talking about history, especially about our capital city and about George Washington. Um, so when I became an historian, uh, I've been a professor now for 31 years, uh, even though I'm only 27. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be a very narrow historian that only wrote on one president or one event or one you know, year or whatever. Uh, I, I wanted to write on all the topics that I loved in American history. So I actually made a list, uh, Civil War, check, Lincoln, check, Revolution, check, Harry Truman, check, uh, Holocaust, World War II. And I wrote books on all those, but I always wanted to write a book about our capital city. And I always wanted to write a book about George Washington. Uh, but I didn't want to repeat all that had been already written. I wanted to find a new angle. And um, it took me a little while. I guess I have a flat learning curve, slow learner. But uh, eventually it came to me that um, even though entire forests have been felled to fill the pages of books on George Washington, uh, that the story really needing to be told was Washington's leadership in creating this wonderful capital city. So in one book, I could kill two stones. I could tell the story, the history of the city and of George Washington's leadership uh, in it. Washington would ultimately pick the location for the capital. He would uh, hire the architects. He picked the uh, commissioners, the three commissioners that oversaw the federal district. Uh, Washington would oversee the surveying of the land. He sold plots of land. He, I mean, from A to Z, it was his city. Uh, Washington would pass on December 14th, 1799. And really from 1789 on, the final decade of his life, he was fixated on this city. This became his project, his baby. I came across letters from other founders who described Washington's interest in the Capitol with the following word, fever. Washington had a fever. In other words, he was just obsessed. He was laser focused uh, on this city. So uh, the reason I wrote the book was that I wanted to write a book on Washington and the city, but I also wanted to do it, uh, write this book for other reasons. One, Washington DC is my favorite city in the United States. And I guess by definition of all of you being here, it's probably yours as well. I love the tree line National Mall. Uh, I love the majestic uh, government buildings. Of course, the Smithsonian's. Um, uh, I love the touching memorials and monuments to our heroes and our fall. And so I love the city. So I, I, I just really wanted to do something to do justice to the history of this great city. Relatedly, I've always felt that history historians, we've done a bad job remembering and presenting George Washington. Yes, on one hand, he's revered today, as he should be. He is the first American. He is the most iconic American. Yet, I've always felt that of all the founders, Washington is the hardest to know, the least knowable, in that over the last two centuries, he comes across history as more monument than man, more myth than flesh and blood. Um, so I, I knew that Washington was a complex individual, a multifaceted personality. So I always wanted to kind of peel back the layers of the onion and flesh out the real George Washington, the complexities uh, of him. For example, it's often been said that Washington was apolitical. He disliked politics, never got involved in politics. The answer is baloney. <laughs> he was a politician. He served so much alcohol when he first ran for office. It was it was basically gallons of alcohol provoked. <laughs> he knew what people wanted. Washington was a politician. Now he was also an honorable leader uh, with a moral compass. But Washington um, could twist arms, swap votes, lobby, cajole with the best of them. There's no better example than with this capital city. Um, the 1790 Residence Act would be the legislation that would end up setting our beautiful capital city. Um, and when they first voted for it, they were four votes shy. Now, four votes is a lot back then because there were only a few senators. Washington instructs, uh, talks to Hamilton about it, instructs James Madison um, to call for another vote immediately. Madison was uh, sometimes nicknamed in Congress the big knife because he could cut such deals. Um, so uh, Madison and Hamilton think Washington is nuts. Uh, call for another vote immediately. We just had a vote. We're having lunch. You want another vote right away? Washington said yes. And what Washington wanted, Washington got. Uh, so they called for another vote. Of course it will fail. It doesn't. Washington goes to visit. He's four votes shy. He goes to visit four senators. Not five, not six, four. He knew exactly which four to visit. And guess what, everyone? He flipped all four. 
Now that's a politician. He flipped all four. Unfortunately, he didn't write about how he did that. So we don't know exactly how he flipped the four. Uh, I'd like to imagine that it went something like this. Washington, of course, is six foot two, size 13 shoes, broad shouldered, powerful big man. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the largest men that a lot of men had, had met at the time. So I imagine you're a senator and you're sitting in your office and you're ready to go back for another vote. And all of a sudden the doorway uh, fills up with this massive man in full attire. And Washington probably said something to the effect of, son, I'm gonna need you to do something for me. <laughs> and the answer would be, sir, yes, sir. So there we go. So that I wanted to flesh out those aspects of Washington. Let me pull up a PowerPoint while I'm filibustering here. Uh, there we go. Uh, another example of Washington's personality, which we absolutely see on display with this Capitol. I think no better example than during the Capitol is this Washington was entrepreneurial. He was um, creative, he was innovative, and he would need every bit of that creativity because this fight, this effort to build a capital city truly was a battle. It was a battle. It was a an epic knockdown drag out battle. And then many times it looked like it would not happen. I think if you replay history 10 times, if you take George out of the equation, I don't think we have a capital city and then everything changes as a result. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. So Washington was innovative, entrepreneurial, uh, creative. For example, at Mount Vernon, his farm, he grew pretty much every crop that could grow in the area. He was an innovative farmer. He ordered the latest techniques, the latest books, the latest equipment from London. He even grew tropical fruit in a greenhouse. Washington used aquaculture. He had a fish farm. He distilled certain products, agricultural products into alcohols that other people didn't think could be done. So he was creative and innovative. During the Revolutionary War, here's his task. He's gonna take a ragtag band of poorly trained farmers and ill-equipped blacksmiths against the world's greatest military. Good luck with that. Washington lacked a military education, but what did he do? He was creative, he adapted, he was innovative. And what we see is Washington pulls this off. He does the impossible. Um, likewise, as the inaugural president, the framers and all their genius in the hot humid summer of 1787 at the Constitutional Convention give us a brand new form of government, heretofore unseen on this earth. They went so far beyond what the Roman Senate or even the classic Greek philosophers had contemplated for this idea of popular government, what Lincoln would later call of, by, for the people. So uh, we have this brand new form of government and then they create for Washington or the, you know, for the office, a brand new office in the presidency. Washington's the first president. He has no template. There's no model. There's no historical precedent. So what does he do again? Makes it up just like he did during the war. He's innovative, he's, crea he's creative. Um, Washington exhibits two, I think, a, a few, but very important leadership traits here. And this would be apparent and on display in the building of the capital city, as well as what I just talked about. One, he wasn't afraid to fail. He wasn't afraid to fail, which allowed him to create, be creative and, and, and innovative and, and experimental. So he wasn't afraid to fail. Secondly, Washington knew how little he knew. He knew he wasn't well-traveled or that well-read. He wasn't well-educated at all, especially when compared to the others who gathered in Philadelphia to frame a constitution. So Washington knew his reading, his travel was very limited. So he surrounded himself with the best of the best of the best, and he listened to them. So that's a, a little backstory for the book and what we got into here. So whenever you talk about Washington, people always say two things. Top of the screen, did he cut down the cherry tree? The answer is nope. Uh, bottom of the screen, did he have wooden teeth? The answer, nope. Uh, that's Augustine Washington at the top, uh, George's father who had passed away when George was young. The story about the cherry tree was made up by a preacher turned bookseller by the name of Parson Mason Locke Weems, W-E-E-M-S, um, who would uh, wanna sell books about Washington's life and around the fifth edition, 1803, 1804-ish, he comes up with a story of the cherry tree because Weems likes these kind of Aesop's fables like the mouse who took the thorns out of the lion paw, lion's paw. He wants sort of a moral 
bedtime story that parents can tell their kids. And what's a better story than when George was a young man, he couldn't tell a lie. Washington did not have wooden teeth. Uh, you see the metal, there were gold springs, hippopotamus ivory, horse's teeth, uh, just a, a horrific ordeal. Um, Washington writes a letter to his dentist, Dr. John Greenwood, uh, where he once said, you know, from all the red wine and such that he drank, he said tea, he said his teeth are staining and looking like wood. How do I clean them? That's where that comes from. All right, so let's jump into our story. The Revolutionary War runs from 1775 in the spring until the fall of 1783. That's eight years, a long war that left the country in ruin economically, as well as lives lost and so forth. Um, now, Washington had only been back to Mount Vernon once, his beloved Mount Vernon, during the war. He was eager to retire and go back home. Uh, the farms were not doing well, roof leaking, some of the fields were not productive, uh, so he needed to get back and tend to business. Uh, however, duty would once again call. That period from 1783 to 1787, those four years between the end of the war and the Constitutional Convention is referred to by scholars as the uh, critical period. It didn't look like this country was going to make it. Washington doesn't know that we're going to make it. It looks very doubtful. So he realizes he's still needed. Now, Washington, and you can see his great quote there, with our fate will the destiny of unborn millions be involved. So Washington knows that what they're working on will make or break uh, the future of this new fledgling republic. Uh, so Washington identifies a few problems. Number one, we're not going to endure. Uh, our currency is worthless. The states are bickering. The British had blockaded our ports for years. Therefore, entire communities had gone belly up. We couldn't pay back our veterans. We couldn't pay our, our creditors and allies in Europe, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French. Um, there were still threats from a number of sources to this, this new nation, as well as internal threats to this new nation. So we may not make it. We need something to help uh, inject some confidence uh, into this government. Number two, we had no credibility in the eyes of Europe. They saw us as a cultural upstart, a backwater, which we were. Uh, but how do you conduct treaties, trade, alliances if you have no respect in the eyes of Europe? So we need to do something to gain that kind of respect. Number three, there was no sense of a national identity or sense of an American ethos or pride. Um, you can't start a new nation if people don't have a sense of nationhood. For example, if you could take a time machine and go back and meet Mr. Jefferson, and you ask Jefferson about his country or his nation, his answer would have been Virginia. So we need something to imbue the people with a sense of national identity or pride. Another problem, we saw a north-south rift already start to emerge. And we saw the emergence of factions, which would become parties. The Federalists led by, uh, well, Washington would have been a Federalist led by John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, Ben Franklin, and the Anti-Federalists, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and so on. And, and so we see this kind of bickering. And of course, the big problem, we don't have a permanent seat for government. We don't have a capital. Uh, you know, we fought the war from 1775 on and create a new nation and created a new nation without a capital, without a permanent capital. We had interim uh, capitals. That's no way to start a nation. We would go a full quarter century, 1775 to 1800, without a functioning permanent seat for government. Um, that's no way to start a nation. And we were floundering as it was because we were working under the Articles of Confederation. So Washington comes up with a solution for all these problems. It's one stop shopping, one size fits all. The solution, a city for the ages, a grand and glorious capital. If we build this great capital, it will imbue the people with a sense of national pride and identity. If we put it halfway between the North and South, Neither side will be that upset and it could bring them together. Uh, if the city is larger than Paris or London, we could have credibility in the eyes of Europe. If we rebuild Rome, it will give this fledgling republic, this nascent democracy, a boost. And that's what he did. It's a heck of a vision. That remarkable vision should have come from Franklin or Jefferson or Madison, these 
world-class intellectuals uh, who were traveled. Instead, it came from Washington. So it shows you what kind of visionary he could be. So that was his one-stop shopping to save everything and build the city. He also has this view that we have a brand new form of government, here too for unseen on this earth, brand new form of government. We're gonna build a brand new capital, a brand new type of capital. The two will grow up together. The capital city will inform the development of the nation. Therefore, the politics of architecture, the design, the location of the capital, uh, its contents, all that will help inform the development of this new nation. That is a heady, brilliant vision. And the proof is in the pudding, everybody. It worked. So what you find is when the war ended, uh, a lot of letters, a lot of newspapers, people said things like this. What happens next? Um, have we really fought for this? This is what folks were saying. At least under the British, the ports were built, the ships were defended on the high seas, and we had a, a, a stable currency. At least under the British, you know, modern parlance, the trains were running on time. You know, be careful what you wish for. We kicked the British out and it created a civic vacuum. The physicians, the architects, uh, lawyers all leave. We have very few libraries. We have basically one museum. We have very few colleges. Um, so we are really floundering without the British. We were economically dependent on them. Mercantilism. Uh, England is a wonderful place, but it's a relatively resource poor, crowded island. Uh, America is a fantastic piece of real estate. Fertile valleys, hardwood forests, as far as the eye could see, teeming with wild beasts, which meant meat, furs, rivers. Um, so uh, the natural resources in this country were, are, were and are remarkable. We had this relationship whereby the British would get all these resources, manufacture them and sell them back to us. That's great for the British, not so much for us. So with mounting debts, a nation that was war-torn, we're not going to make it. At least that's what many thought. Here's the other problem we face. There were over 30 cities that at one point or another, to one degree of seriousness or another, were considered to be the capital city. If you're looking at the list and you're thinking Brooklyn, the answer is, yep, must have been the pizza. Even Brooklyn was considered. I put an asterisk after Georgetown because it used to be in Maryland. Maryland and Virginia would then each uh, donate land, seed land for this new capital. Uh, and uh, Maryland donated what was uh, then Georgetown. So here's the problem with so many cities. It was a scrum, it was a food fight. Uh, everybody wanted their own city to be the capital for a couple of reasons. One, they all thought their city was the best, like the Chamber of Commerce, right? We all love our city. Number two, economics. Um, imagine if your city gets to host the permanent capital. Imagine the construction boom, the Congress, the military, the government move in. If you own land in that city, you've just made a lot of money. So for those reasons, everyone, everybody wanted their city to be the capital. Now, the problem was all the cities spent all the time fighting against one another, trying to undermine everybody's bid, and nobody would agree to another city other than theirs. So if we look at my list here, in Connecticut, we had Hartford and New Haven. So Hartford would spend all of its time trying to undermine New Haven. New Haven spent its energies trying to undermine Hartford. The only time those two got together was to make sure the capital didn't end up in Maryland. Meanwhile, in Maryland, you have Annapolis and Baltimore, and Annapolis working all day to undermine Baltimore. Baltimore bad-mouthing Annapolis. The only time they got together was to make sure the capital wasn't in Connecticut. So we see that it, it's impossible. It's a Rubik's Cube, it, no progress being made. There were jokes, and Ben Franklin told it, jokes that maybe um, given how unpopular Congress was and this difficulty in picking a capital, maybe we should have multiple capitals and a rotating capital. There was even the joke, maybe we should build a Trojan horse, hide Congress in it, wheel it up at night outside the city and see if they bring it in. Congress could sneak out, do the business and then skedaddle before anybody realized. So there was a problem picking a city. Ultimately, George would say, none of the above. We're gonna build a brand new city out of bogs, fields and forests. It was basically a swamp, foggy bottom, right? Uh, and that's what they would do. We didn't have a functioning government. We had the Articles, 
of Confederation, which you all know about because all of us went to school when we actually used to teach civics, right? Um, so um, have we fought for this? George Washington um, has some views. One, this nation may not endure from 1783, the end of the war to the Constitutional Convention in 87. But he also offers us some interesting insights into the Constitutional Convention. We all know that the framers argued there are all these wonderful paintings of the framers standing around, you know, like this, like Captain Morgan or something, uh, looking civil. Uh, that's not how it was. They were arguing. Let's not forget, they're creating a brand new government that may not work, probably won't work. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a heated summer. There were clearly debates that raged over slavery, over the three-fifths clause, an utterly unacceptable solution, over how to pick a president. And they came up with the Electoral College, another unacceptable uh, solution, which they saw as the least horrendous option. The framers were geniuses, but not infallible. However, according to Washington and a few others there, as you see from the quote at the top, the most intense and explosive debate of the Constitutional Convention was what? Where to put the Capitol? That was the debate, where to put the Capitol. Washington writes, selecting the seat of government is pregnant with, you know, it's, it's pregnant with difficulty and danger. Um, where do we put the Capitol? He was concerned, as were others, that if the framers tried to locate the Capitol at the convention, which they should have done, then no one would sign the Constitution. The, the, the location of the capital city was so contentious that it could undermine the Constitution, which means it would have ended the experiment in uh, the United States. So what did they do? They didn't pick a location for the Capitol uh, during the Constitutional Convention. All they did was figure out how big this here to, you know, unnamed city would eventually be. Um, it would be 10 miles square. I call these the other founding, this the other founding debate. Should we have a Capitol? Where should it be? Who should pay for it? Who should build it? Uh, what's its design? What kind of buildings and, and, and should go inside the city? and how it will influence the nation. This is the vigorous debate. Everyone's aware of this. Everybody bemoans it. Everybody argues. Everybody has skin in the game, so to speak. But it's really just Washington who is looking around the corner to figure out how this is going to come to be. It's his baby. It's his vision. How big would the Capitol be? 10 miles square. Uh, Article 1, as you can see in the middle of the screen, Section 8, Paragraph 17, they lay out the details of the city, uh, of, 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 of what should happen in this, this federal district, and so on. Uh, it would be 10 miles square. Everyone, that makes this thing bigger than Rome, bigger than ancient Athens, bigger than Paris, bigger than London. The audacity for a, an upstart country without architects <laughs> that's broke, um, doesn't have a bank. Uh, that we are going to build this great city. So that's the plan. Okay, so after the Constitutional Convention, there's difficulty ratifying it. Ultimately, that happens. Now we need to figure out we don't have a permanent capital yet. So where should George Washington be inaugurated? Where should the first Congress meet? They decided New York City. There were really only about three cities large enough, that is, they had enough boarding houses and kind of uh, infrastructure by today's parlance to host it. That would be New York, Boston, and the largest city, Philadelphia. Um, so uh, they gather in New York City. Lower left, the picture you're looking at is Federal Hall. You all know that. Uh, this becomes sort of the first capital, so to speak, uh, where government uh, goes. Uh, Washington, the statue of him out front that I love, uh, that's where he is uh, sworn in. It's right there on Wall Street, everybody, right off beside the stock market. Uh, stock Exchange. It's very near uh, the Trinity Church, uh, which if you're looking at this picture, just to the left, a half a block where Hamilton and other important folks are buried. And it's just down the street from my favorite place in New York City, and that would be Francis Tavern. Uh, that's where Washington and all the founders would go to eat. They even got takeout from Francis Tavern. Yes, everyone, we had takeout in 1789, just not Chinese food for the fortune cookie. Um, so the building on the lower right, that would be the first White House, so to speak, the presidential mansion. That's the Osgood Cherry Street home where George governed. Now, the problem was that no one liked New York City and 
everybody was still arguing for their city to be uh, the capital. And the South did not want the capital in the North. The Southerners even threatened, they refused to cooperate or compromise. They even threatened to leave the Union if the capital was in the North. So Jefferson shows the displeasure of many with New York City. He and Southerners don't like the weather, it's too cold. Jefferson writes, spring and fall they never have, as far as I can learn. Just 10 months of winter and two of summer. Take that, New York. Um, Fisher Ames of Massachusetts, who was a real hoot, uh, sense of humor. Uh, he complained that New York City was overrun by hogs, dogs, and garbage. So they knew they didn't like New York City. They knew the capital would move someplace where they had no idea. Uh, they just knew they needed out of New York City. It was interim. So how did we decide where to put it? That would occur at the second most famous dinner in history, the second most important dinner in history. It's a dinner that takes place on June 20th, 1790 at Thomas Jefferson's rented home at 57 Maiden Lane in New York City. It was a dinner between Jefferson and Hamilton, as you can see there, and Jefferson would invite his friend and ally and fellow Virginian, James Madison. Uh, this, as Jane said earlier at the, in the introduction, is uh, the room where it happened. Um, so uh, I used to call this the most influential and most famous dinner. Uh, but about 25 years ago, I was giving a speech about the, the dinner deal, the dinner bargain. And a woman in the audience started yelling at me. And I said, ma'am, what is the matter? And she said, that's not the most important dinner in history. That would be the Last Supper. So I said, oops, I'm sorry. So ever since then, I call it the second. So what happens is this. We have two factions, the Federalists led by Hamilton, Franklin, Jay, Adams, Washington, and the Anti-Federalists, uh, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and so forth. The Federalists tended to be folks from the North, tended to be from cities, tended to be interested in governing, tended, they wanted uh, some kind of revenue stream, they wanted to pay back the debt, uh, they wanted to build ports, ships, uh, bridges, uh, internal improvements, infrastructure, they wanted to pay our veterans. Then you had the Anti-Federalists. They tended to be slave owners, oftentimes in the South, uh, rural. Uh, they seemed to be disinterested in governing. They didn't want a strong government. They seemed to be interested in nothing but keeping slavery. Um, and that was the headbutting. The problem for Jefferson was that as the Secretary of State and head of the Anti-Federalists, whenever he debated with Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury and head of the Federalists, the person that Washington always sided with was what? Hamilton, because Washington saw Hamilton as the son he never had. So Jefferson was always beaten by Hamilton. But on the night before uh, this dinner party, June 19th, Jefferson is outside of Washington's home on Cherry Street, New York, and he hears music to his ears. Hamilton and Washington are arguing, fighting. It's volcanic. So uh, Je uh, Jefferson describes Hamilton coming out of the meeting, looking depressed and disheveled. So Jefferson realizes there's a rift between the father and son. Now is the time to strike. So Jefferson invites Hamilton to his house to resolve all these matters. The location of the capital, the debt, all these matters were gridlocked, gridlocked. It was like politics today. So Jefferson invites Hamilton over uh, for dinner and drinks, and to solve the matters. Jefferson believes Hamilton is vulnerable and depressed. Jefferson knows that he'll dupe Hamilton and get everything he wants. To stack the odds, Jefferson invites Madison, so it's now two against one. Long story short, Hamilton ends up duping Jefferson and Madison. Hamilton gets everything he wants. Jefferson would later write a letter to Washington saying when he realized what had happened, it was the worst moment of his political career. So case in point, the debt, uh, we have a massive debt. Hamilton does a debt study and it's about $80 million. We have about $3 million in revenue coming in. So do the math. Um, uh, so we need to cover the debt, uh, some kind of tax, uh, some kind of plan for the debt. The problem is uh, Madison and Jefferson pretty much announced that Virginia refuses to pay its uh, debt. The South will not contribute to the debt. They won't cooperate. The North can't cover the debt. Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania basically funded the war. If the North can't cover the debt, the South refuses to contribute revenue or the debt. They don't want to do anything. Um, that's an impossible situation. It also advantages Southerners who don't want much of a government. 
Uh, Hamilton agrees with that. Jefferson thinks he's getting everything. What he doesn't realize is that if that's the situation, the only way to deal with the debt is what's called debt assumption. The federal government assumes state debts. That means we need a bank. That means, means we need a national currency. That means we need a strong treasury. That means we need credit debt. Who designs all that? Hamilton. That's what Hamilton wanted all along. He gets everything he wants and pretends he loses. Jefferson gets nothing that he wants. Where should the capital be? This is an ongoing debate. The debate is included uh, at this famous dinner uh, party. What should the capital look like? Jefferson and Madison wanted it in the South. It's pretty much non-negotiable. Hamilton would like it in New York. He was raised in Nevis and St. Croix and the West Indies, moves to New York. Um, the Southerners are really refusing to cooperate. But Hamilton's okay with that. Why? He knows ultimately Washington is already going to put the capital uh, in which he picks the location uh, in 1791, a year later, on land ceded from Maryland and Virginia, near his home, by the way. So Hamilton essentially gives away that which is already decided and uses it as leverage to get more of what he wants and needs. What should the capital look like? Uh, the, the debate occurs at, at this dinner party. Uh, ultimately, um, there would be a design competition for the actual Capitol building, uh, which was announced in March of 1792. Um, what uh, the deal is, is uh, Jefferson and Madison, they want a simple federal town. Get, they want a capital that's just a few acres with one story, simple brick buildings, each separated by fields and forests. Why do they want that? The politics of architecture. They don't want a strong federal government. They don't want much of a government. If your capital is a few acres and single story brick buildings separated by forests, you don't have a cap much of a, a government. Uh, politics of architecture. Hamilton and Washington want Rome. They want a glorious city with uh, white buildings and marble co uh, columns and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so, uh, Jefferson wants uh, the simple one. Jefferson says, why don't we have a design contest, not only for the Capitol building, but for the Capitol city, and we'll pick the winner. Ultimately, Jefferson, it appears, submits his own design anonymously and says, I'll chair the committee, and he picks his own design. Um, Hamilton goes along with it because Hamilton knows that Washington will refuse to accept that design, which he does. So this dinner party really helps set uh, in motion, all these great issues that form uh, our government. The problem was, who do we pick as an architect? We don't have architects. Uh, we find an architect in a Frenchman, Pierre Peter Charles L'Enfant. Um, L'Enfant is a perfect choice. He's uh, educated in Paris. He's an architect and an engineer. He fought in the Revolutionary War and fought with great heroism and valor. Uh, so they trusted him. He was a Mason. Uh, fellow Mason who could bring Masons in to help the great stone Masons and others. And perhaps most importantly, L'Enfant was a megalomaniac. He wanted to rebuild Rome, wanted to build something greater than Paris. All that was music to Washington's ears, and they shared a vision for the city. L'Enfant would claim to resign. Others claim that he was fired after about a year, but his plan was already put in place. And here's the plan. Uh, you can see the Capitol Mall right there in the middle, right? Um, uh, what Washington likes, L'Enfant wants grand wide boulevards like Rome and Paris that intersect at angles. And where they intersect, there would be squares filled with public monuments and memorials. Washington even eventually wanted a national university. And we have American University today. Washington wanted um, us, uh, cultural institutions. We would get to Smithsonian. Washington wanted a city that would bring the best and brightest together. And L'Enfant's design was, was enlightened and it would become the basis for designing that wonderful capital city. We need the president's home. So who's gonna take care of the president's home? Um, James Hoban. Washington heard that there were some remarkable structures um, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, another lovely city with great architecture. Uh, he goes and he falls in love with them. It turns out this Irishman uh, had designed um, a lot of those structures. So he is hired. Uh, he wins the prize of either $500 or a medal of equivalent value to build a presidential palace. Hoban also shares Washington's outsized uh, vision for a presidential palace. And here's a design. 
oval rooms for the rage in Europe. It's going to have oval rooms, and you can see the building design there on the right. Um, looks a lot like our uh, White House today. Uh, one of the few differences is they ran out of money, so they had to shrink the scale of it, uh, much smaller than Hoban and Washington had originally wanted. What about the actual Capitol itself, the Capitol building? Uh, well, they had a design contest, as you heard me say, in March of 17. 92 uh, for a $500 award. And they had 17 plans submitted. None of them were feasible. None of them were acceptable. So they're floundering. They don't know what to do. A letter comes in later. And the letter that comes in later is from this man, Dr. William Thornton. Uh, he lived in the British West Indies. Uh, he had been educated in medicine in Scotland. He was kind of a Renaissance man. And his plan had uh, two wings, one for each chamber of Congress. And folks liked this plan. Um, it was accepted uh, uh, several months later in April of 1793. And that's September of 1793. Washington would lay the cornerstone in a Masonic ceremony. And we get this magnificent Capitol building. Um, uh, Lon Font, when he selected a location for the Capitol, and it was all politically uh, oriented, um, you know, the Masonic symbolism of the diamond shape of the city, um, you know, the Capitol and the, the president's house opposite one another to symbolize, you know, separation of powers and so on. The Capitol should be elevated as should the president's home. It was put on a spot called Jenkins Hill. And L'Enfant said it's a, such a perfect location. It is a pedestal waiting for a monument. Um, in closing, um, the city, would, for a while, it was contemplated it would be named Washingtonopolis. Uh, I wonder if Samuel and Jane and others would agree that I, uh, you know, it, I, I'm probably glad that they got rid of the opolis. <laughs> Just call it Washington. Um, at any rate, um, Washington would pick the location. Uh, Washington would hire architects. He would pick the uh, three federal commissioners who were all friends of his and of like mind on these kind of views helped survey the land, hired some of the surveyors, helped sell plots of land, bought a plot of land there, uh, really oversaw the project. Uh, shortly before his death, uh, Washington is reading letters from and meeting with the federal commissioners. When he leaves Philadelphia and heads back home to Mount Vernon, he stops to visit. So for a decade, it is his final battle. It was a, a very a difficult struggle and arguably without Washington, this wouldn't have worked. Uh, folks in New York City went along with the plan because at least they got to host the Capitol for one year. That was the Hamilton Jefferson deal at the dinner. Uh, New York for one year, then Philadelphia for nine years. So therefore, they would give a decade to building Washington City. It would open up on, uh, and I always like this picture, it would open up on November 1st, 1800. And the first person that would move into that presidential home and its most famous resident at the time was none other than John Adams. Uh, you know, whenever we travel up and down the Eastern seaboard, uh, virtually every uh, uh, colonial town or bed and breakfast says what? Washington slept here, uh, but he never slept in the building that would become known to us as the White House. He passes one year before it opens. John Adams moves in on November 1st, 1800. It's not the city of today. Uh, there's hammering and sawing everywhere and construction, which keeps him up at night. Only six rooms in the presidential home are finished. Uh, it smells of wet plaster. It's leaking. And he's disturbed by the sight of slave labor everywhere. Yes, a terrible irony for this wonderful temple of liberty is slave labor builds the president's home, the Capitol building, the city. Slaves toiled uh, to, to do that. Um, but Adams recognizes Washington's great vision for this city and home. Um, and Adams really played no role in it because George, it was his baby from A to Z. But Adams recognizes that genius and that vision. He writes a letter to Abigail, who's still back in Massachusetts, telling her that this home, the presidential home is, is you know, in a position to be in, inhabited. And he now requests her company. But then Adams writes a poetic prayer, uh, which shortly before his death, uh, and uh, on April 12th, 1945, FDR had carved into one of the many fireplace mantles in the White House. And Adams's prayer says, I pray to heaven, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings upon this house and all who shall hereafter reside in it. 
may none but wise and honorable men ever rule under this roof. Uh, so that's the story uh, in a nutshell of Washington's extraordinary vision, extraordinary leadership, and extraordinary commitment. No one else could have pulled this off to build this magnificent city and of course this wonderful Capitol building that you all do such a great job of celebrating and, and preserving. And there's a shameless plug <laughs> for my book, had to throw that in. Again, Jane, Samuel, and everybody in the audience, thank you for, um, uh, for your uh, time. Well, thank you very much, Professor Watson. We are honored to have your, give your perspective and really it, you, you do tell a story in a very engaging manner. We've got a couple of questions that have come in from our audience. Um, and one is a simple one and then one is more complicated. So let's do the simple one. Um, there were no cities considered in either the Carolinas or Georgia. Was there a rationale for that or was that just a happenstance? Okay, thank you for that. First off, Sharon, thanks for the compliment in the chat room and thanks for the person that asked that question. It's a very good question. Um, cities at the time in the summer were overrun with a, a, an array of diseases, uh, yellow fever, Philadelphia would be hit by it and a variety of maladies um, to the point where uh, uh, the late summer, summers and falls were often referred to as the sickly season. Now this is especially true in the South, the Carolinas, Georgia. It was, imagine uh, these communities before draining and dredging, before mosquito control and before air conditioning. They were utterly unlivable and at those periods in time. Second, uh, the Carolinas and Georgia, this was you know, very, very rural at the time. There were no major road or waterways to connect people to those communities with the exception of Charleston, perhaps. Um, so therefore, logistically, it was hard to get to those cities. Uh, another concern was they figured that the capital needed to be on the coast. Uh, for trade and transportation. Um, military, you needed waterways. Uh, the site selected of Washington, D.C. today, uh, it provides access to the Potomac, an important river, the Chesapeake, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so all but basically Charleston and Savannah really lacked that ability. And the port in Savannah was not the port of latter years. It was, it was not enough to, to, to handle the kind of traffic maritime traffic of the need. So for all those reasons, uh, and a very, very, very sparse population. Remember, the southern population was pretty much Virginia. Um, for those reasons, those cities were, sim those states were simply not considered as being viable. And so let's, let's talk for a minute about uh, George Washington. Was there anything was there any concern about his personal financial interests? And did he have a personal financial interest in oh, picking yeah. a site along the Potomac? Boy, by today's standards, Jane, he would be brought up with the House Ethics Committee on conflict of interest, emoluments. That would be in a violation of the emoluments clause, which would, you know, come out. Uh, yeah, Washington happened to own land near the Capitol, happened to live near the Capitol. He had a vested interest in it. He stood to conceivably make money uh, off of it. So yeah, there was some concern. Uh, Washington picked the three commissioners and all three lived in that same area, were wealthy landowners in that same area in the Virginia, Maryland border of the Potomac. Um, yeah, the, some of Washington's uh, advisors and allies uh, wrote to him saying, this could look bad. You need to tone it down a little bit there weren't the kind of conflict of interest laws that we have today. So what he did in advocating that site, it was not illegal. By today's standards, there could be some, you know, crossing of the T's and dotting of the I's. But at the time, yeah, it was perceived as he had a self-interest in it. Um, it. It was not the big political issue that you would think it would be. In part, Washington won the Revolutionary War. No one else could have done it. He was the great hero. He was, you know, uh, revered. Uh, kind of a thing. So um, uh, it wasn't the big political story that it otherwise would have been. The other political story that related to that, Jane, was this. Um, there was concern about putting the capital in Philadelphia because Philadelphia was filled with abolitionists, Quakers. 
What would Southern members of Congress do if they brought their slaves with them to Philadelphia? Uh, would it, if there was a law in Philadelphia, if, if a slave was there for X amount of time, they would be freed. So Washington was even concerned when he went to Philadelphia, the interim capital for nine years. Uh, he served um, you know, seven of his eight years from Philadelphia. Washington was concerned about his slaves there. He did take slaves with him, a chef, for example. So Washington kind of skirted that by bringing slaves with him, but they would only stay a short period of time, go back to Mount Vernon, and then others would come in and back and forth. So that was seen as a little bit of an ethical issue. And there was a little bit, you know, their eyebrows were raised over that as well. So yeah, there were some ethical concerns, no question. So let's follow on that. Uh, one of the questions was, you know, looking at today's standards uh, applied to yesterday's behavior. Um, and we're seeing many uh, communities reimagine the deference to which they hold our founding fathers because of their uh, role as slave owners. Um, would you like to talk about how that may impact uh, George Washington? Sure, no question about it. So of course the cardinal rule in history is you can't use a 2021 standard to judge something that happened in 1787. Um, and we all know that. However, I always put a dot, dot, dot after that. When it comes to issues of war and peace, genocide and slavery, I think we can use today's standard or any standard at any period of time. Slavery, genocide, these things are wrong wherever, whenever they happen. Now, if you take the issue of the monuments uh, being taken down and reimagining the founders, I do favor taking down Confederate memorials. I don't like the idea of tearing them down or desecrating them. It should be done in a civil manner through a vote. Um, why? We need to remember Jefferson Davis uh, and Robert E. Lee attacked the United States of America, shredded the Constitution, and 620,000 Americans died in the Civil War. You know, we would never celebrate bin Laden, who killed 3,000 Americans. Don't celebrate the killing of 620,000. Uh, and remember, these folks sent their sons to die in a war to perpetuate human bondage. Now, don't tear the memorials down. Put them in a museum. Put them at a battlefield. Gettysburg is one of the most remarkable battlefields in the world. It's filled with memorials and monuments to everyone. So I differentiate. If it's there to celebrate, no. If it's there to educate, yes, celebrate or educate. Should we revisit the, the, the founder's legacy? You bet. We should always revisit it. History is not fully written. It's never too early for a first draft, and we should never have a last draft. History is living, breathing, and evolving with our perspectives. Was Washington a slave owner? Yes. Must that be a part of the narrative? Yes. Is that a blemish? Yes. Ditto with Jefferson. However, all people are complex. All people are complicated. And please don't misconstrue. I've devoted my 31-year career. I teach our courses on civil rights, women's history. Uh, I, you know, I've devoted my life to writing about this and causes. I've, I've marched in uh, Black Lives Matter rallies and so on. Me Too rallies. But all people are complicated and complex, and great men are oftentimes complicated men. We need to look at them in their entirety. I don't believe Jefferson Davis rises to that level where he, he should not be you know, torn down. Robert E. Lee was a, a gentleman and a great general, but I don't think he rises to that level. I do believe Washington does rise to that level. His lifetime of actions uh, stand the test of time with one horrific, noticeable, glaring exception, slavery. So that must be part of the narrative. I say keep the Washington Memorial, continue to keep the name of the city, but inject the full story so that we might educate people and fully flesh out uh, this complicated issue. Okay, we've got two, two questions and, and not very many minutes. So I'm gonna put the two of them together and you can do a lightning round response. Um, was, what, what was the rationale for residents of Washington, D.C. not being able to vote um, and have federal representation? And was there any consideration of moving Washington, uh, moving the Capitol out of Washington after the British burned all the iconic buildings? Okay, two great questions. So the second one first, it's easier. Uh, August 24th, 1814, 
uh, General Robert Ross and, and, and Admiral Coburn and Cochrane uh, came into the city and burned it to the ground, burning um, uh, the capital. Uh, remember, our great capital was built, burned, rebuilt, refurbished. It's got a heck of a story. It's got a great narrative in and of itself that you and Samuel know better than anyone. Um, there, yes, there was a lot of consideration of moving the capital city, no question. There were proposals, other cities were offering buildings, other cities were lobbying for it. And there were votes, there was a vote in the house, which almost passed. It really, it, 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 at one point it was a tied vote in the house. Now Madison wanted to keep it in Washington so he would have vetoed anything that came forward. So there was a lot of conversation about moving it. Um, uh, there was also conversation at the time and later about moving it westward as the country moved westward. One person proposed Pittsburgh, for example. We should move it west as the country moved um, uh, west. Now, D.C. Uh, all along, they, the framers realized that this capital cannot be in an existing city or it could be beholden to that city. We shouldn't have the capital under a state. It would be beholden to that state. It needs to be independent. So they all along wanted an independent federal district. They wanted that district named for Christopher Columbus. So they took the feminine district of Columbia um, and for the capital city. Another concern was in um, June 20th of eight, 1783, there was a mutiny, uh, an uprising, not unlike January 6th, where a group of fake patriots attacked the building we know as Independence Hall today threatening political leaders inside, wanting to bash the windows and wanting to bust the doors in. And that really scared elected officials. They realized our capital needs to be secure. It needs to be an independent federal district. Consequently, the downside of that is DC residents have not had full uh, rights. Um, in subsequent years, a large African-American community of former slaves moved to DC. Racism absolutely played a role and no progress towards statehood for DC. I have always favored statehood. DC has what, 700,000 people? That's 200,000 more than Wyoming. It's roughly the size of Vermont, uh, Alaska, North Dakota. Um, you know, I think it's beyond time to um, uh, give folks their full rights. We'd have to rearrange the federal district and shrink DC down to just the mall. And the rest of it would be the 51st state of Douglas or Potomac or whatever name. And those names have all been floated. So, yeah, great questions. Thank you. Well, Robert, thank you so much. Thank My you for pleasure. your time. Thank you for taking the time to write the book and to tell us about it. Um, we are delighted to learn more. As you say, history will never, never be fully written because we are continuing to evaluate our past as we look to what can we learn from the, as we move forward to the present and the future. So we are in a moment now where we are going to be uh, going into the holiday season. Um, so we will not be having a program next week. Um, we do, however, encourage you to come this afternoon if you're around to our holiday bazaar. Um, one of the real joys of working at the Historical Society is that we have commemorative holiday products, uh, ornaments, bookends, uh, paper, uh, paperweights, all that are made with marble from the Capitol, stone from the Capitol. Um, that, and this year of all years is a time to invest in a way to honor the Capitol as our temple of democracy. So if you can't come today, you can go on our website and look at the products. We'll be having uh, bazaars on Thursday afternoon through the month of December. Uh, but if you want to have something, you can have it mailed to you or you can call us, order it and swing by and pick it up whenever, uh, whenever it works in your schedule. And know that when you do that, you're not only honoring the Capitol and having a very unique gift that you can give to your friends, neighbors, colleagues, clients, um, family, but you also are supporting the work of the Capitol Historical Society. We are uh, 
as we always say, this is our NPR moment. Um, we do not receive money from the government. We were chartered by the government, but we are totally supported by our members and donors. And so we thank you for participating. We thank you, Dr. Watson, for donating your time um, as a scholar to come and, and talk with us. And people contribute to the society in many different ways. And we are honored to have you And this uh, session has been recorded, uh, will be available on our website, and all who are registered will get a notice so you can share it with your friends and neighbors. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. And uh, by the way, I have two of those holiday mementos, and I encourage everybody to support the society. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Be well. Bye-bye.